Uh, I heard Joy speak on this word shalom, and uh, there are words in the Bible, particularly Hebrew words, that we just sometimes, it just don't translate well, fully better, into the English language, like peace. So uh, when Joy spoke this, I really felt it was a word of God, and I wanted her to speak it over us. And especially, I think, I think it's going to have an impact on your life. Right? I think it's going to have an impact on your life if you're open to this. If you really desire God and you're asking for them, Him, I think this word's going to really bless you. All right, so let's welcome Joy in our prayer. Thank you, Joy. Well, I have to say, um, I have been thoroughly blessed just through uh, the worship and um, I don't know, Mike, whether there's like something of the tears when, that you carry, but I've just um, had to uh, stop myself having mascara all the way down my um, face. Uh, it's just such a beautiful presence of God here and the way that you all worship um, and the corporate sense of his presence and his power has really blessed me. So thank you so much for the invite. It's really lovely to be here and feel like I'm um, amongst family, uh, so many uh, familiar friends and, and old friends. Um, and uh, I'm from uh, a live church in Lincoln North and they send their love. So they're meeting right now as well at Bishop Grot University. And so um, uh, isn't it great that we can be part of a network and a connection um, and just have that friendship? So uh, Mike, uh, like you said, uh, has invited me to speak on Shalom, and I want to kind of contextualise it a little bit for, it was last November actually, or October, um, that I spoke that, and I, I just feel like I've heard some prophetic things in the meantime, and so I just want to add to it a little bit. Um, on Easter Sunday, April the 17th this year, I woke up and I felt prophetically, heard in the spirit that uh, God said, the transfer zone will take place between July and November this year. And I wrote it in my journal, I write all the kind of things I hear God say prophetically in my journal, and just left it. I thought, I don't even know what that means, the transfer zone. Um, left it and came back to it in June as I was just finishing that journal and indexing everything that I felt God say in a kind of contents page. And it just caught my attention. April the 17th, God said the transfer zone would be between uh, July and November. And I thought, maybe that's like um, a football term, you know, the kind of transfer window. People swap in and swap out. And, uh, but I thought, I'm just going to Google it. I Googled it and found out that it's a... The um, not a theological term, sorry. It's a geological term uh, that happens uh, when tectonic plates are put under pressure and stress and they move around and the whole landscape shifts. And it caught my attention. I was like, oh, God saying between July and November, the pressure and stress is going to be so big. Uh, I believe in the nation. That's what he was uh, talking about, but also potentially in our lives. And it's going to shift some rocks around and it's going to change the landscape around us. You know, the, um, the children of God, uh, the children of Issachar, the Bible says, know the times and the seasons and they know what to do. And so when I'm asking God, so what time is it prophetically? What are you doing? Um, I feel like uh, he's saying we're in Hebrews 12 times. This is what Hebrews 12 says. At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he's promised, once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably, acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. He is, and... And it's him we look to in the middle of the shaking and the shifting. And uh, when we think about what time it is, just a little added thing. Uh, around July, early July, someone said to me, um, God's calling you to be like a cockerel, like a rooster. And you need to cock-a-doodle-do the time you think it is. And, um, 
And so what does the rooster do? He uh, wakes the dawn before the dawn. And I learned this the hard way because I was camping in July. And um, it was about a week after I received this uh, uh, word. And we were on a farm in Norfolk. And at quarter to four, every single morning, there's a rooster who must have just been right beside my bed, just outside (laughs) the tent, uh, would cock-a-doodle-do and uh, awaken the dawn two hours. They wake the dawn up two hours before the dawn actually comes up and um, the first night I was like oh oh that's interesting that's what the prophetic um, guy said over me about the rooster and uh, then I could hear him waking his mates up across the valley and they're all cock-a-doodle doing each other waking each other up and waking the ecosystem up and um, and then it happened the next night (laughs) and I was like oh gosh I have like I feel like You've already told me, God, that, and I understand that now. And Paul, my husband, was lying next to me going, can you hear the rooster again? I was like, yeah, it's real. Can you not miss it? Anyway, it happened for seven nights. And by the end of this, you know, when we went home, I was exhausted because we've really not slept very well. Um, probably dropped off at about six o'clock when the sun comes up and then the kids wake up at seven. And, um, but what I felt like God say to me was, you are you're a rooster and your role is... In this season, there's a new dawn that is breaking. I'm shifting the landscape. Everything's changing. And it feels dark at the moment. And it feels like uh, uh, something is going to happen. He makes all things new. He's always doing a new thing. He renews all things. uh, And the light will come. But your job as the church, not just me, is to cock-a-doodle-do and wake each other up. We need to wake each other up around the valley, uh, declare this is a new day, it's a new dawn. Uh, the, the sun's not come up yet, but it will come up, and it's not our job to bring the sun up. The rooster just tells everyone the sun's coming up. Uh, the sun comes up itself. God will bring light to our nation, but our job as his church and his prophetic people is to say, cock do it's coming, there's something coming, but there's a landscape shift that is taking place in our nation that feels pressured and difficult and hard to see prime ministers coming and going, polarization over immigration and uh, our hospitality for the vulnerable, the planet feels like it's on fire, There's war in Europe. COVID's still around. Famine in Afghanistan and Somalia and the Yemen. Cost of living crisis that is affecting everyone. Fuel prices. And a mental health challenge for our children and our young people. That breaks my heart. And when the landscape is shifting... Our job as his people is to fix our eyes and worship him. He's a consuming fire, but also to herald in the dawn and partner with him to see the light come. And so I want to take you to the Bible and help us understand some of what it looks like for us to partner with Jesus to bring the light in our nation or just in our villages, just our families. I want you to close your eyes. I want you to picture a vast refugee camp on the edge of the greatest metropolis of the world. The people who live there have been forced from their homeland by an invading army and they've seen their city ransacked, their families murdered and their sacred places of worship destroyed. Their landscape has been shifted. They've been through the transfer zone. These exiles have lost everything. Everything that was important to them, the future is uncertain and each day is clouded with ambiguity, with little meaning or purpose beyond survival. And they wait day after day, hoping they will awaken from this nightmare that's become their life. You can open your eyes. hope you feel it and see it. The transfer zones shifted everything for them. The time is the 5th century BC. The city is the great city of Babylon, the capital of the ancient empire ruled by King Nebuchadnezzar, and the exiles are the best and the brightest of what had been Israel. Historically, Nebuchadnezzar, who's the king, had a unique strategy for keeping countries that he conquered from rising up against him. He'd round up all the leaders, particularly the finest and the brightest young men and maybe women, and take them back to Babylon. Unlike many rulers of his time, he didn't enslave them, but he wanted to assimilate them so that uh, they got the culture of Babylon. 
But these Israelite captives refused to assimilate. Instead, they were camped together on the outskirts of the city, and false prophets in the camp were telling them not to go down to the city, but to stay away, because God's planning to raise up a great army and come and rescue them and deliver them. And so they were just waiting on the edge of the city. And one day, a letter is brought to these people, these exiles in Babylon, from their homeland. It's from the prophet Jeremiah. He was left behind, and he writes to them a letter that radically changes the Jewish people's perception of how they needed to live in this alien land. And part of the letter reads this. This is what the Lord of the heavens armies, the God of Israel, says to all of you captives that have been exiled to Babylon from Jerusalem. Build homes and plan to stay. Plant gardens and eat the food that they produce. Marry and have children. Then find spouses for them so that you may have grandchildren. Multiply, don't dwindle away, and work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, for its welfare will determine your welfare. So in this letter from Jeremiah to the exiles, he's telling them, not only does God still love them, don't worry, God still loves you. I know that you've been taken out of your homeland, but you've also got a really important plan uh, to work out with me in this place. He reminds them in the passage that even though their situation has drastically changed since they left Jerusalem, their mission as God's people remains the same. They're to fulfill the original calling that God gave them in Genesis 1.28, to partner with God, to fill the whole earth, to subdue it and rule over everything in it and become useful as God's image bearers and human beings create his paradise on earth with him. The Christian Community Development Association says this. I think it'll come up on the screen. When God created the heavens and the earth, he wove it all together like a million silk threads forming a dazzling garment never before seen. Each thread passing over and under and around millions of others to create a perfectly complementary, tightly woven, interdependent, amazing whole. This wondrous webbing together of God and man and all of creation is what the Hebrew prophets call shalom. There's a guy called Cornelius Plantinga. I love his name. It's very, very cool. He says, shalom is the webbing together of God, humans, and all creation in justice, fulfillment, and delight. This is a robust vision of peace. That's not merely the absence of conflict, which we would see as peace, but it's a wholeness in all of its forms. And you know, the full cause, this beautiful interconnectedness, the relationships of God and the world and other people to be fragmented and torn apart, to be frayed, broken into pieces. And through Jeremiah, God is calling his people back to their original calling, to weave himself through their lives back into the ultimate fabric of his wonderful creation. To weave himself in society and community and to bring wholeness and completeness to people's lives. Shalom is a word packed with hope for a fragmented and broken, bruised and wounded world. It speaks of wholeness, of right relationships, of justice, of salvation, of righteousness, of being woven back together in a beautiful tapestry of God's goodness. And I think all of this can be missed if we just simply read the word in this letter from Jeremiah, peace, seek the peace of the city, seek the shalom of the city. If we read this through a Western postmodern mindset, then we totally miss it. See, the Hebrew mindset is so different to ours. Um, We've got a a kind of Western, postmodern, individualistic, more Greek mindset, and the Hebrew mindset is way more holistic. It's really important to identify that we're swimming in different water, and the culture, the prevailing worldview, just shapes everything about um, who we are and how we think. You might uh, be able to see it in individualism or consumerism or humanism, or uh, you might just sum it up in the kind of me first mentality 
Another way of saying it might be that we've got kind of glasses on that we're looking at the world through and uh, we look at uh, the world in this way, um, not always through the kind of Hebrew Bible, biblical way of looking at things. So we have to work really hard just to invite Jesus to transform us by the renewing of our minds so that we can see things the way that he uh, sees things. And the Hebrew um, people would... Uh, never see peace in the way that we see it, which is just working for a personal state of calm or a lack of anxiety. Um, The Hebrew people would uh, always see that they're connected to everyone around them, so they wouldn't disconnect themselves from anyone. They were swimming in the water of a kind of interconnected, holistic worldview. The the glasses that they were wearing uh, helped them see and understand that the well-being of their neighbours is just as important as their own way of well-being. In fact, their own well-being is directly correlated with the well-being of the the neighbours. And you can see how we've interpreted Jeremiah 29 verse 11 through an individualistic worldview. So loads of the young people I work with say, well, God's got a plan for me and it's about me and, and my purpose. But I think it's really different when you look at it in the Hebrew depth of the word Shalom. And through the Hebrew mindset. So let me just show you, if you've got your Bible, you can look at um, Jeremiah 29, verse 11. And he says this, For I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. And this is what? Jeremiah is really saying, and the Hebrews would have known this, we kind of have to look at it quite deeply to understand it. He says, it's like, I know the thinking that I'm thinking towards you. I know the plans I have for you. I I know the intimate thoughts that I have for you. And this word plans is in Hebrew, and I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but I've got a friend who is, and he confirms and has helped me with this, is Mahashava. And it's from a root word, hashav, which means to weave or to plait fabric. So the plans, I know the intimate thoughts I have for you. They're plans about weaving. I'm going to weave my plans. God's saying that I'm kind of weaving, my, or planning on weaving you and me together with all of my other weaving. So there's this picture of like a kind of woven fabric that, That's what he's thinking about. That's his plans and the intimate thoughts that he's got for us, that he wants to weave us back into that beautiful tapestry called Shalom. And then he says, I've got plans to give you hope and a future. And this word hope is kavar, and it comes from a uh, root word that means to bind a cord or a thread. So my hope is that I am pulling you back in and binding you together for a future which is an expected end that will go on for eternity. So the kind of picture that Jeremiah is painting in this word picture is that God says, with you and me, together with the rest of my weaving, I'm going to plait you together and into a hope that will go on and on and on forever for all of his goodness in eternity. Do you know what's really helped me as I've looked at some of the crisis that we're in and the transfer zone that we're living through and I'm thinking, what's going to happen? What's going to become of the church? Uh, All these young people leaving our church, what's going to become of the church? What's going to become of our economy? What's going to become of the people that are coming across the seas to find refuge and uh, the way that we're speaking about them? And then I believe God when he says, I'm weaving you and all of those people. My end goal is to plait everything together for a hopeful future. Biblical scholars tell us that shalom signifies uh, lots of things. Community and connectedness and wholeness and integrity and salvation. Righteousness and justice. And the deep and rich idea of Hebrew shalom goes into the New Testament with the word peace, irene, 
In the classic Greek, this word literally means a condition of law and order that results in blessing or prosperity. And isn't it wonderful that God sent his son, the Prince of Peace, so that we can have access to this restored, redeemed relationship with him. And through the power of restored relationship with our creator, other relationships around us that were broken can be woven back together. Our relationship with ourselves, our self-esteem, grows when we know who we are in Jesus. And our relationship with other people can be healed and restored as we're in the flow of his redemptive power. And our relationship with our broken world that is so desperate to be reconnected and restored, that is his plan for us. Jesus isn't just a prince who will come back to stop all fighting and war. He's the prince who comes back to restore shalom. Full reconciliation with everything. I don't know if you've heard of the uh, Japanese art of kintsugi. Uh, I think it's really beautiful. Um, They uh, restore broken things using a kind of golden glue that um, sees all the cracks of what once was broken. I think it powerfully really illustrates how Jesus restores the broken bits of our lives and the world and then holds them together. And you can get these kintsugi kits online, which um, is basically paying quite a lot of money for the privilege of two small pots that you have to break yourself and then mix some glue with some uh, gold glitter. But as I was thinking about this, I bought some just, um, uh, it was for my friend's baby shower, actually, she was adopting And I just thought it was a beautiful picture of what adoption looks like. And and so I'd bought these and um, needed to kind of practice with it before we had the baby shower. And and it was around the time we'd had um, some guys from Battelle come to our um, church service. And they came back for lunch at our house. And um, they shared their testimony a little bit like Ben shared, like the power of God shaping and bringing what was once broken into wholeness. And this couple, wonderful couple, Mark and Sarah, um, were helping us with the kintsugi kit and they were messing around with it. And my then 13-year-old little boy was kind of smashing it up and helping. And um, what I just found so powerful, it makes me well up every time, was Mark from Battelle sat with Finn, my 13-year-old, and picked up the idea of the golden glue and Jesus and just start telling him about his life and his brokenness and the fatherlessness that he had and how Jesus brought him back into the family and um, was like the glue that holds everything back together. And he's the golden glue that brings us back together, but he brings the world back together. And we're his people his ambassadors, and he charges us with the ministry of reconciliation, bringing things back together. Our very being is to embody shalom in the world. So the day that the letter from the prophet Jeremiah is brought from Israel to the exiles, a large crowd assembles to hear it. I want you to imagine this. They're wondering, are they going to say, God's on his way to rescue you? And so they're here with anticipation And we can imagine that amongst that crowd on that day, there were four young men who heard the letter and said to one another, yes, this is God's call on our life. We are going to be committed to working for the shalom of this place that he's put us in. The peace and well-being of this great city. And shortly afterwards, they find themselves chosen for training with the goal of serving in King Nebuchadnezzar's court. The book of Daniel writes about these young men and records it like this. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, the name Belshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. And we know what happened to Daniel as he heard that letter and responded, the influence and uh, incredible authority that he was given in the king's court. This letter radically changed those four Jewish lads' perspectives in terms of how they should live and work. 
And Daniel and his mates understood that for them to find shalom in their own lives, it would mean working for shalom in other people's lives. And so as we look around Lincolnshire, our nation, in the middle of the transfer zone where everything feels shaky and we're not even sure if we can put our heating on yet and whether we can manage and what about all of the other people in our community who don't have the hope of Jesus. I think the absence of shalom is so evident everywhere. That mental health crisis that is so difficult for our young people. Poverty, food bank usage, broken relationships, broken families, a fatherless generation, unemployment and economy that is broken. Could add loads more to the list. But in Romans 8, Paul describes creation as aching and longing for the children of God to be revealed. In fact, he paints this wonderful picture of like creation almost being on tiptoes with its head, neck, stretched out and his neck stretched out looking and wondering who are the children that are going to liberate this world and bring us back into restored order. Paul describes the church, you and me, as the answer to the longing and the brokenness of creation. And we get the joy of gathering together. One of the amazing, powerful things about being here with you this morning is remembering it's not just us in our community at Bishop Grot Uni at 10.30, but there are lights all over this county of godly people who love Jesus and want to be together and maybe wouldn't be friends normally, but because of Jesus are in the same room, in the same family, in the same community as one another. And in this moment of uncertainty and the transfer zone, There's a fresh invitation from heaven today. The Holy Spirit, I believe, is whispering to you guys, mark it, raisin, new life. You have an invitation to join God in the renewing and restoring and weaving of his beautiful picture tapestry that is fragmented and frayed. And he's calling us in the middle of this rocky, uncertain difficult season to join him and say we're not just going to step back and look after ourselves but we are going to serve and love and weave with him to bring wholeness back as the landscape shifts and we're walking into the new dawn whatever that looks like what does it look like I think it really looks like believing that the action doesn't just happen in here on a Sunday morning, but that it happens wherever you go tomorrow and whatever you do in your uh, workplace, in your community. You know, only 3% of the church are in full-time Christian ministry, which leaves 97% of the people who are called light bringers to bring light wherever God has placed them. I think it's really important to recognize that we are imperfect weavers, that we are joining the perfect one in his mission, but we're all a little bit broken and that we need him to restore us daily and bring us back together into his beautiful, dazzling tapestry of shalom. And so the invitation this morning, I think, echoes the invitation that Paul gave to the Corinthians 2,000 years ago to join Jesus in his ministry of reconciliation, to weave the world back together. And I just want to tell you before I finish about some people that I see doing this in their family, in their workplace, uh, through paid work or volunteering, and some of the changes that we're seeing happen. Actually, I wonder if we could have some music as we, I'd love to pray and uh, I, always, I always feel like the Holy Spirit enjoys working with the musicians. <laughs> so let me tell you about Keith. Keith runs a retail consultancy to support large and small businesses to make their supply chains more ethical. He works all over the world and he understands that large supply chain means disconnect and fragmentation from uh, the people who are giving uh, the, maybe the t-shirt in Bangladesh and then the person in Lincoln who wears that t-shirt. So Keith's working to help the supply chain become more connected together, more ethical. He's reweaving shalom in fashion retail. And there's someone called Ruth in my uh, church community. She's a cleaner 
And she sees her job as a ministry to bring peace and order back to other people's lives and homes and families, busy parents who are out working. Ruth's reweaving shalom through housekeeping. As we heard from the Holy Spirit about the transfer zone, um, me and Paul, my husband, we were like, what, what's our response to this, to kind of reweave shalom? And Paul is just, he's like a monk. He loves prayer so much. He just loves being in the presence of God. And he said, we have to watch and pray in this season. And so for us, reweaving shalom looks like having a Zoom prayer meeting at quarter to seven till quarter past seven every morning between uh, September and um, the end of November. We're watching and praying and asking God to protect our nation and to wake the church up and so that's what it looks like for us at the moment that's how we're reweaving shalom my one of my closest friends she's called Marie Claire and um she's um she's got an incredible vision to see social justice come through the lives of local schools and the children who have no chance uh, to be part of an outstanding school that cares for them and their families and to transform lives through education. And uh, she's doing that across the whole of Lincolnshire and kind of bringing schools together across Lincolnshire, reweaving shalom in the fabric of our county's education system. And then Bob is a village caretaker. He litter picks and fixes broken benches and he keeps the book exchange really tidy. And he prays for the local kids who go to school every morning. He's weaving shalom in his village. And Andy, who's a deputy head, he literally takes his inspiration from Daniel and aspires to be 10, 10, 10 times better as a teacher. His attitude towards his kids got him noticed and then he won National Teacher of the Year award. And Andy is reweaving shalom in the lives of little children. Then my friends Joe and Dan, it always makes me really emotional. They adopted a little girl called Hope. She'd been abandoned and rejected and, and she's now the missing piece in the Hargreaves family. And on Monday, we're going to the court to celebrate that she's officially a Hargreaves. And uh, so good, isn't it? And God is reweaving shalom in Hope's life that's so different to what it could have been like. But also she's, he's reweaving shalom in the Hargreaves family because it would be so different without her. And in their church community that they lead, they're modeling something of family that means loads of other people are now thinking about fostering and adoption. And so there are just a few different ways that I've seen. You know, it could be in a shop as a shopkeeper, it could be as a nurse, could be uh, as a cleaner, could be as a grandparent. But I want to ask you, what does it look like for you to say yes to this invitation? To get your needle and thread out and to join Jesus in weaving the world around you back together. I'd love you to just close your eyes and invite the Holy Spirit there's all those examples, but you're unique and the way he speaks to you is unique and the world around you and your little corner of the tapestry of God's shalom is unique. And I just want to acknowledge that sometimes we feel frayed and tattered, especially in the transfer zone. In this moment, we've had three years of COVID and difficulty and news that is terrifying and first, before we do anything with God, we just want to make space to be with him and to let him reweave our fragmented bits, the broken bits in us. So Holy Spirit, I just invite you, would you come minister now? The tangible presence of your goodness and your peace, the peace that brings salvation and justice and righteousness and hope. We receive that peace right now. Just allow it to settle in your heart, in your mind.
whether it's your body that needs that wholeness, it's not just that heart feeling, fuzzy feeling, it's literally being, things are brought back together. If you've got um, injury or sickness, just release the presence of God, the healing power of shalom of God. For depression, I pray it lifts. Anxiety goes. Joint pains and heart problems have no space in the kingdom of God. Like uh, we were uh, being exhorted earlier by Mike. All of those things pass away. All the brokenness goes. He makes all things new. And so we receive your renewal in our body and in our mind and in our heart. And as we do that, would you speak to us? What would you like us to do with you? What does it look like for you to follow Jesus in this ministry of reconciliation? I just want you to imagine what it would look like if all those lights across Lincolnshire, all the people in the body of Christ across our county took this really seriously and said, it's not the action in here, but it's the stuff out there as we go with him. Our county could be changed. Those children who have no hope could hear hope and see hope and know love. Our elderly population would, could find friendship and purpose. Our economy could be transformed as people understand that this is their worship as they go into their workplace and not just something they do to get through the week. So I pray, Jesus, would you commission us to go with you, to walk with you and to be with you as you restore the world around us. And we pray, God, let the soil of our county be changed and transformed. That Lincolnshire would be a beacon of your light and your hope in this brokenness. As you shift the landscape around, I pray for a light to shine that's so bright that no one can ignore it in our county. And a move of your spirit that would call people back to relationship with you. And we ask that in your name, Jesus. Amen.